So this podcast, the, these 15 to 17 minutes, which is the max I'd like to do, um, I have my uh, dear friend and um, someone who is very inspiring and I personally look up to, uh, Damien Warren Smith, next to me. Uh, he is the creator of The Gary Star, Gary Star. Gary Star. But Instagram is at The Gary Star. The Gary Star, because there's another Gary Star. <laughs> On the Gary Star. The Gary Star, double R, double R. Yes, the Gary Star, two R's in Gary, two R's in Star, four R's in total. And the reason, to me personally, why you're inspiring is because I think I relate to your journey a little bit, and we met and you told me uh, your story. So I thought it would be good if other people can hear your story. You have said this before, but not on my podcast, so here we go. Yes. Um, so, Damien. Yes. How did. Uh, Am I right in thinking that Gary Starr is, the, is, for now, the main thing to talk about? It's a show that you've created, but I'm actually more interested in how you've found this one thing that is now the one thing. Because um, I think, am I right in thinking that early 2017 or late 2016 even, the world... No, late 2017, the world was very different for you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Which is just a year ago. Yeah, so I, I think... So the character Gary Starr started to emerge... You know, a clown troupe I was part of called the Plague of Idiots, which I actually started with some fellow graduates from Gollier. And what is Gollier? Gollier is uh, it's a clown school. It's 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 it's, it's a man's name, Philippe Gollier, mm. um, and he runs a clown school. Well, it's a theatre school, but it's more famous for clowns than anything else. And it's just just south of Paris. Um, and sorry, how long were you there for? I did two terms. So I've done. I, I went straight there and did the first term of the second year, which was the clown module as well as uh, Le Jeu, which is the first you know, sort of section of the first year. Then I went away for a year and came back and completed the first term of the first year. Not, not the normal way of doing things. Um, well, I'm sorry to already interrupt, because that's like, poof, out of nowhere you go to Clown School, Gaudier, which is a renowned uh, school for acting and also clown. But before that, you had a journey already of performing. I was an actor, yes. So yeah. I was an actor for that 10, 10, 11 years before I went there. So I trained, you know, in a tradi traditional drama school in Australia. I uh, spent a year or so there, and then came to to London, and I worked on the Fringe to begin with for a few years, and then got a break into a you know, professional theatre, and then started to tour. Um, I did a little bit of little bit of TV um, commercials, a little bit of film, but mostly I did theatre and touring theatre, and then I started to specialise more and more in multi role. So I'd be brought in to play, you know, four or five characters in a in a show, silly hat, silly costume. Costumes, silly wigs, silly walks, stuff like that, um, and then uh, and then that's when I discovered that I had a flair for comedy. Mm -hmm. But the thing that really um, that I well, I think I, I stumbled post upon clown, not really realizing before that this was a a, a theatrical thing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then found it really challenging, and so followed that. I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I sort of gave up acting, I guess, to go to clown school. When you say um, you felt your, well, I don't know actually what you said, but ability to comedy, and then you skipped the word clown, is there a difference to you, or what is what is clown to you, what does it mean? Well, I think I was talking, I think I, what I mean by that is comedic acting, like I was mm -hmm. doing plays, comedy plays, where there's quite clearly a fourth wall, um, where you're given a script and you, and you know the lines and you, and you try and be funny, whereas clown was this whole new world to me where... There's, there's no fourth wall, and a clown is like a big kid on the stage. And just it, more than anything, it was about listening. I still remember back when I was at drama school, one of my teachers saying to me, "You need to work on your listening skills as an actor, like listening to the other actor." Like, I didn't know what he meant. I was like, "But I'm hearing everything they're saying." And then the two worlds where listening is is right at the forefront of what you do is improv and clown. Improv because you have to listen to everything your fellow performers say because you know they'll come in and go oh hi Steve and you have to remember your name Steve you have to know where you are what everything you say you have to listen because you're and writing then, on the spot you're writing on the with, spot exactly with, with other, you know, nice. and then clown because you have to listen to the audience mm. uh, you know one of the first rules in clown is if there's a laugh you look to, you look at the person who laughed and to learn to do that having come from comedic theatre was a massive massive thing because we're talk that's what we do as a kid if we, we do something and someone laughs so we look straight at them and we 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 beam with smile and then we tr we do the same thing again to try and make that same person laugh 
and then it's beat out of you because it's called showing off. It's like, don't show off. So then as adults, we make people laugh and they're laughing and we, we stop ourselves from looking. We're kind of like, oh, they're laughing and they're laughing at what I did, but I'm not going to look because that'll, that'll show them that I, that I enjoyed I think the sort fact. of back in the box. Like, yeah. I was a bit naughty there, but now back in the box. Yeah. <laughs> and so Clarence is going back to me, a kid again. You do something, someone's laughing, and you look straight at them. And you, and you say in your head, that was funny, wasn't it? You go, do you want to do it again? <laughs> so you do it again, and they laugh, and you go, yeah. And then you keep doing it, and they stop laughing, and then, you, and then you're like, oh, they didn't find that funny. And that moment, too, is also very funny, seeing an adult disappoint, like genuinely the moment disappointed that they've stopped being funny. What about the moment that you've milked it to? Well, I, I say milk it, and I, I, you didn't say that. But if you've, you've repeated it, and the, the kind of the smile, the laughter disappears. Yeah. How, how, maybe we should get to it later, but that happens as well. Yeah, I mean, like a great way to deal with the flop. And you don't want to go to this all the time, is to name that as well. So you do it, and you do it again, and then and then you do it again. I don't laugh, and you go, oh, it's, like, it's only funny the first two times, wasn't it? Like, <laughs> no, yeah. first time was as good, was it? Like if you genuinely <laughs> acknowledge, it makes me laugh now. Yeah, yeah, you go, it wasn't. The first two were way better than the third one, wasn't it? And then quite often you can get away with the fourth. Yeah. And you can go, I'm going, to try, I'm going to try one more time. And then, of course, you do it again and it gets a big laugh. Mm. Um, you know, when you don't want to constantly fall back on that because people see that trick. They go, oh, he's just naming everything. But it's always somewhere you can go. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So you realise this world of clown, the world of breaking the fourth wall, and the world of listening to your audience. And then how did you get to Gollier? Um, yeah, I was, sort of, I was at a point in my life where I could, I, I, I could, I could leave London and, you know, so I went off to, I'd done a few workshops with people who had trained under Philippe mm. in, in London and in Manchester. And then uh, there was an opportunity where I could you had a bit of money and had some freedom. So I went off to France and, and trained with him. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, we formed a clown troupe and we started to tour. We took a show out to Australia, The Plague of Idiots. Um, and then... The Plague of Idiots, a troupe, how many? There was originally the six, I think. And who says that? Uh, it was all of us, the six oh. of us. From we were the ones who sort of at the end of the well, some of us anyway, who had shows, had like numbers in the final show at Gollier, which did well. So we were like, oh, I wonder if we can do this as a show. So we came and did it in London for a few nights at the Hen and Chickens, and then um, and then I said to everyone, guys, do you want to take this to Australia? And <laughs> we were a plague of idiots, and everyone was like, yeah. It was like a you know a Swiss girl, two Italian guys, a Frenchman, an Englishman, and then the me, the Aussie. And we took this clown show to Australia. We did the Western Australian Circus Festival, Perth Fringe World, Adelaide Fringe, and um, you good? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Sorry, just and, checking. Um, yeah, so good. And, uh, and it went really well. And then the Gilded Balloon were out there. Karen Corrin from the Gilded Balloon, which is in Edinburgh venue. And she said, come and bring it to Edinburgh. So I said to the idiots, do you want to do it to Edinburgh? And they were like, yeah, because we weren't making any money. You can't. You did the play in Edinburgh? Yeah. So that was your first to, time? Yep. So we did the Edinburgh there. We did Edinburgh for two years in a row. So which year was that? That was 2015, I guess. Mm-hmm, okay. And then again, 2016. Also with a new show, which was called Waltzing Matilda, which was just mm-hmm. me and Lulu from Play of Idiots. And we did a kids show that year as well, which was too much. We did three shows mm. most days. Um, so, okay, so you got your experience with... Um, creating a clown show, obviously with others. You got your experience with going to Edinburgh with your your own show, and you had your experience with taking a show even overseas somewhere else. Yeah, so that's that's a nice um, nice experience. Mm. And I, and I think look, I mean, there's a lot of ways to go about this kind of stuff. But for me, it would never have happened if I if I'd sat down and crunched the numbers. Mm. And it never would have happened if I'd put some forethought into it. Mm. But the fact that I just went, guys, let's do this, and mm. everyone said, yeah, let's do it. And we all lost a lot of money, but we had a wonderful time. It's the foundation. Yeah, and this, I mean, for me anyway, it was the launch pad into, not only did the character Gary Starr come from that, but it gave me the access to this to this whole world of the fringe circuit. So it wasn't scary then, because I'd been there and I'd done a show. Yeah. So when it was the thought of taking a solo show to Australia, it didn't seem like a stretch. Mm. And so the Gary Starr um, character was already part of this Plague of Idiots show. Yeah, he became... So it started off as... His name was Monsieur Loyal, and I was the sort of, you know, English toff, and I wore a, a, a three-piece suit, you know, and this was the character. And, and, and then we worked with the director who actually directed my two solo shows, Cal McChrystal, on, um, on Plague of Idiots, just How for a few though? days. How? Because that sounds really casual and stuff, but 
How does how does the director um, like come Christmas? Sunday so we'd done Australia. We'd done that little London run, and we did three festivals in Australia. And then we sat down with the idiots, and we said, "Okay, do we want to do Edinburgh? Being fully aware that we're going to lose more money, and if we if we all want to do it, what do we want to do differently?" And we all agreed that we wanted to work with a director. Mm-hmm. And so we said, okay, who's, who's the best director that we can think of for Clown? And we all count with Crystal because he's incredible. He's one of the best directors in the world for Clown. So I sent him an email. You know, I think I sent him some clips as well. And I said, this is who we are. Because he'd also trained with Philippe Collier. And uh, I said, will you... I didn't ask him to direct. I said, will you work with us for a few days? And he said, yes. So, you know, we paid him, obviously. And we got together and we showed him what we had. Because we already had a show. Mm. And he... He just, he, first of all, he came in and he changed all our costumes. He's like, okay, this, these costumes you've got, they make sense to, to Gollier people. But, like, for example, Richard was a Boy Scout. He said, you come out and say just a Boy Scout, and then you don't act like a Boy Scout. We're like, why is he not acting like a Boy Scout? Mm. So he's the one who said, okay, I just want you to wear what you consider to be your best. And so we all sort of suited up in these, in these sort of you know, highbrow outfits, but all completely mismatching highbrow outfits. And it worked all of a sudden, because people saw that we were... A play trying, <laughs> yeah, trying to present something which was very highbrow, but we were very low intelligence. So all of a sudden that made sense. Um, and then he restructured the scenes. He, he, sw- he, he ordered the show. He's very good at at um, putting a bunch of scenes in order to create a show because he directs circus too, like Gifford mm. Circus. So he'll get all the different acts. We've already got acts. And he'll go, this needs to go there, this goes there. Here, put a song there, put that there, put that there. And it just goes bang. So he really tightened the show up for Edinburgh, and then we got some great reviews in Edinburgh um, off the back of that. I'm really sorry, this is the second year, third year in Edinburgh, second year. This was the first time. Oh, the first yeah. time already? Okay, yeah. wow, okay. Yeah, and then we went back, we back the second year as well with a couple of new shows too. And also with Cal? Uh, we didn't work with him again because it was the same show but slightly tweaked. And you, you had kind of, you, you, you gained from him what you needed? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's always been, it would have been beneficial to have him on again. But uh, I think it was a mistake going back a second year with a, a, like almost the same show because we didn't we didn't take a step up. We were thinking that we kind of you know would have got an audience from the first one and then that would have grown for the next year, but it didn't because we were bringing back the same kind of show. Mm-hmm. You've got to go back to something completely new. Um, so it was it was okay. I mean we didn't you know I mean, we had we still averaged like fifty people a night, which is incredible for Edinburgh, yeah. especially when we didn't spend anything on marketing. I mean no posters or mm. anything like that. And, uh, yeah. No, anyway, so what? What then was the um, jump to saying goodbye to the Plague of Idiots? Does yeah. it still exist? Yeah. I mean, we still we still talk about doing a show, but the re- I mean, I can't at the moment because Gary's really taken off, and so that's taken up all my time. So um, how did, how did that jump go? Um, so I moved to Berlin because I realised that I wanted to make work more than. I actually moved to Berlin after the first Plague of Idiots show, mm. for 2016, I guess, um, and lived there for a while because I wanted to start creating my own work more. Um, and yeah, I just did a bit of improv and did um, and started to develop Gary as a solo character. And I built up probably about 30, 40 minutes of material. So I was there for 18 months and then I came back to London and wrote to Cal again and said, look, I'm going to do a solo show now. Do you want to work with me? And he said, yes. So we worked together for a full week this time and we created Gary Star Performs Everything. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that was to do with the fact that because I knew it was sort of always there, I was you know doing the scene, doing the scene, building, building a bit more. Mm-hmm. But then one of my mates uh, sent me an email, you know, sent me a, a wedding invitation in Australia. And at the time, I was so broke, you know, and I thought, oh, I really want to go. I don't want to miss another friend's wedding. Really good friend. And then I looked when the Adelaide Fringe was on. I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can do two weeks of Adelaide, go straight to my mate's wedding, and then come back to the UK. So I can justify, you know, going that, going mm-hmm. for two weeks. Um, for this, and so that was when I said to Cal, let's make a show. Um, yeah? <laughs> She's thinking, just so you know, just so people um, <laughs> listening think, at home, I had a really the good silence question. Is, is Robin thinking. Gary Star, when you say, uh, Gary, yeah, you said Gary Star performs everything was created for that, but um, because uh, for the people who haven't seen Gary Star performs everything, Gary Star is an actor the the show is a, is a masterclass on on acting acting has died and he's bringing back it back to life yeah theatre i guess theatre theatre sorry okay yeah. theatre so it's 14 disciplines 14 different yeah 14 takes genres on. in less than 60 minutes yes uh, from a character that um believes he he is the best in everything and and knows it and can help people yeah he's he's slightly misguided 
disgraced Shakespearean actor, I say, and the, the, the backstory is that he gets kicked out of the Royal Shakespeare Company and uh, decides that was, the arts are going to die without him. So he mounts his own show in which he performs every single genre of theatre in under an hour in order to save the performing 14. arts from inevitable extinction. And, you know, there's some, there's some really obvious ones. You do classical and, um, uh, like, melodrama, and, but then he also does things like Butoh, which is a Japanese dance theatre, so there's a few you know, weird ones in there as well. Yeah. No, it's, well, yeah, for the ones in Australia, it's, uh, they're lucky that they can go and see it now, in 2019, because it's mm. not, it's not in the planning for the UK, um, this one. I haven't got any more dates booked for the first show, because I'm going to come back and do the new show, mm. which I've just developed and just previewed here in, in London, and which will premiere at the Adelaide Fringe Festival on the 15th of February. Which is similar to the first one, Gary Stark performs everything. Yes, the same guy. Again. Yeah, and same, same, you know, previewed. In fact, it's almost identical. I created it in December with Cal, previewed in December, two shows, whereas last time I did three shows, and then it premiered at the Adelaide Fringe before doing a, a run at the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and that's essentially what I'm doing with this one, the new show. So you did, and then you did Australia... And uh, it went so when you went straight to Edinburgh, then or did you have yeah you had pre shows? Yeah, I came back and I did Brighton Fringe, Manchester Fringe, and Buxton Fringe. And, and you won them. prizes. I did win prizes. I think in all of them. No, Buxton. I was nominated for a prize. That still helps. Yeah, but I got the comedy award in Manchester. I got nominated for the comedy award in Brighton, but won a different award, the other place award. So, first show is touring Australia now and premiering the second show. The second show is going to Edinburgh. This might sound more provocative or challenging than I mean it, but when you say you took the second Plague of Idiots to Edinburgh, that might have been a mistake because it wasn't as different. How is this second show, Gary Starr, different from the first one you, you did in 2018 in Edinburgh? Well, I mean, it's a completely different show. Yeah, it's like a, it's a different premise. It's, it's the same guy, but he's... Look, there's, there's a similar feel to it in that he's doing lots of scenes but he's got a different reason for doing it. In the new show, which is called Gary Starr Conquers Troy, um, which is also, you know, I mean, I think it's a good title, but I don't know if it completely sums up what the show is, because it's this time poster, around... It's a, yeah. it's a very good... Yeah. But this <laughs> time around, we had, to, we had to start selling the show before we knew what it was, whereas performs everything. I made the show first, I had a really clear idea of what it was, and then found the title. Yeah. Whereas this one, we were like, hey, what are we going to do for the next show? I was like, well, maybe something to do with Greek mythology. Okay, what sounds like a good type of the title? I came up with Conquest Troy. Whereas the show's become more about, and Gary, you know, on the back of the success of his first show, has decided that he's going to write a book on acting because he's qualified to do that now. Um, and so the new show is him, uh, you know, launching his new book on acting. But it's heavily influenced by Greek mythology um, with a... At the moment, anyway, a, um, a final scene which really explains Troy. Like, it's like, why is it about Troy? Um, but uh, it's it's a totally different vibe. It's the people who see the food see the first one. I think really enjoyed the fact that they're like, oh yeah, it's the same guy trying to do something way beyond his means um, and ha having very little understanding of what he's doing, but doing it with gusto. Mm -hmm. And so that's the similarity, but it's it's a completely different show. So at the same time, for people who are watching it for the first time and getting to know Gary Starr, it will still make sense. Yeah, and I, I made a point of not having any reference. There's a couple of times where I sort of will reference the first show without making a point of it. Mm -hmm. Like I'll say something which people who've seen the first show will go, oh, he's, he's saying that because in the first show this happened. So it'll get, it'll, you know, it may get a laugh or not, but the people who, who haven't seen the first show won't feel like they're missing out. They may be like, oh, that was a bigger laugh than I thought. I wonder why that was funny. But I don't think you need to see the first one in order to get the second one. And from a production perspective, how did you, how did you approach that? Because obviously this was still you doing it on your own, you approaching Cal, you creating mm -hmm. it. How did a you work with a producer? I, I work with a producer for touring the show, mm -hmm. um, Milky, who's in um, in Melbourne. But I, I produce the show myself, so I make it myself with my own money, um, and I pay everyone who's involved um, an upfront fee. So there's no, uh, there's no, I don't, no one owns any any residual payments mm -hmm. from the show because I want a, a complete ownership of, ship of my work. So um, I mean, I, I don't plan to work with another producer for touring other than. Laura Milky in Melbourne so essentially from now on she'll take a cut or whatever mm -hmm. but there's no she doesn't have any ownership over the work and I, for me that was really important that, that I, I made it myself which means it's really low budget like both shows I've made for um, you know less than two and a half grand mm. which 
for me it was, yeah, it was, it was really important to be able to do that. Yeah, but it's also touring the world, so it, it's, a, it's a beautiful and inspiring proof that it can be done, and it's yeah. not about the budget per se, it's, yeah. about the, it's about the work. And also I've never applied for funding either, because I didn't... I've never wanted to uh, for someone else to. Oh, we've gone. Have we gone too, too long? No, there's minutes. no too long. It's okay. just a good chat. But and I want to continue talking. But I also the reason for these shorter amount of uh, um, minutes is because um, my personal attention span normally, but not obviously when I'm in the conversation. Um, but I think it's it's uh, it's it's good if we keep it short and sweet. But I, uh, overall. You, you did it and you did it yourself and it's it's um, it's kind of bulletproof because it's 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 clear and it's a it's a wonderful character it's a it's a gorgeous show and it's and you're, you're doing it and it's it's really really great to see um, that happening from from years and years of of I don't know if ser that's not your word but searching or trying which I recognize maybe a lot of if, if it's performance or not it's creating isn't it yeah so it's it's it is really really good to see something mm. click in it's funny because I, I mean I always I always knew that I'd have a solo show at some point even from way back when I was in drama school but my idea of what it would be was very different mm. but it doesn't feel like I was ever really searching or trying to find it I was just no. kind of waiting like I knew it would happen, and I just kept following the things that enjoyed me and challenged me, which were quite often one and the same. Um, and it and it emerged, and I mm. trust that. Um, and I remember still being back at drama school, a lot of people saying things like, "Putting a time limit, you know, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a crack for like four or five years, and if I haven't made it, then I'll, I'm going to go and do something else." And that, that was just never my attitude towards it. I was like, mm. well, "I'm always going to." Back then, I said, "Act." But what I meant was perform, mm -hmm. or, you know, and then I just kept questioning. I always asked myself the question, even when I was like working as an actor before I moved into clown, when I took any job, would I do this job if, if I wasn't getting paid? And if the answer was no, then I wouldn't do the job. Mm -hmm. Because if I, if I was doing anything to make money, then I would be doing anything but acting. Like, mm -hmm. If you want to do a job to make money, go and do something that, mm -hmm. that is secure and safe, get a degree. But if you're, if you're going to chase a dream and a passion, then the moment you start to make a living from it, you're going to start to compromise. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's something that you completely made yourself. Or if you're or putting, adore you know, and love and still and love. get inspired yeah, yeah. by it. Okay. I think that's a nice one to, uh, to end, end on. on. Yes. Yes. And well, and lastly, uh, third show? I think there's three in Gary, yeah. I mean, I'm already starting to have ideas for other characters and talking about collaborating with other people as well with series? bits and pieces. You yeah, I think I think there's a, I think there's a web series in it. I think it's got a fly on the wall mockumentary of Gary you know trying to succeed but mm. but failing. Um, yeah, I think there's three three stage shows in Gary. Okay, well we look forward to it. Thanks Thank very you for having much. me. And thanks for your time. And here we go. How was I? Was I good? Yes.